As I said, the ICF is put out by the World Health Organization, and the aims of this document are to provide a scientific basis for the consequences of health conditions. So we want to, uh, we want to look at the, um, the logic and the science underneath health conditions. We also want to establish a common language to improve communication amongst healthcare providers and the general public. And we want to permit comparison of data across countries, healthcare disciplines, services, and time. So that's, that's pretty cool, right? So that is facilitating international research and international tracking and following of disease processes. Finally, the last aim of the ICF is to provide a systematic coding scheme for health information systems. And you will see um, when you browse the ICF that there is indeed a coding system. That can be important for diagnosis, it can be also be important for uh, documentation, and in some cases for submitting to payer sources. Now we're going to look at the ICF components. The first component is body functions. Body functions are the physiological functions of the body systems. So how our systems work. They are coded from no impairment to complete impairment. So they go from everything is working just fine typically to uh, a complete breakdown of a body system. The second factor is body structures, and those concern the anatomical parts of the body. Uh, it's another way of classifying, right? So they are also con uh, coded from no impairment to complete impairment. The third part is activities and participation. And the ICF looks at actions that are taken by individuals called individual perspective and also uh, a person's involvement in a life situation which is which they describe as a societal perspective there's also um, in terms of activities and participation the idea of activities so the things we're doing and then participation meaning how are we doing it how are we involved in the things that we're doing Lastly, there's environmental factors, and this includes all aspects of the external world that would impact a person's functioning. Uh, for example, they give, a, uh, they give uh, an example of curb cuts without textured paving, and this may be um, coded as facilitating a wheelchair user's mobility. However, um, because it's not textured, it may actually be a barrier from someone who, for someone who is blind. So uh, the categories of environmental factors include technology, natural and human-made changes to the environment, support and relationships, attitudes, and services, systems, and policies. For our purposes, if you keep in mind that, that, that it's all of the various things that impact the environment, you'll be on the right track. All right, in this slide, uh, the ICF was written in 2001, so it is kind of old. It's still very, very relevant. And um, this slide is for your study to show you kind of how all of the, the parts and pieces of the ICF fit together. We start with a health condition, and then as you see, we have body functions and structures, which we talked about, activities and participation, and then environmental factors and personal factors. And all of them kind of uh, feed back and forth between each other and link together. So this is uh, a visual model for those of you that like visual models and like to see the gestalt of a situation. Now we turn to the OTPF4, uh, the Occupational Therapy Practice Framework. It was put out by the American Occupational Therapy Association again in 2020. So this is not the actual cover of the print document. It's the logo of AOTA. So stay tuned for the, for the print document. 
This document is the official document of AOTA. In other words, it is uh, underlies our entire practice in the U.S. Uh, there's been multiple editions. We're now on the fourth, obviously. It's designed for both internal, meaning OT practitioners, and external audiences, meaning general public and as well as other healthcare professionals and teams. And it defines and guides practice. Uh, within the OTPF4, there's a section called Cornerstones of OT. And this idea of defining and guiding practice makes it possible for OT practitioners from all different uh, sub-disciplines and across all different geographic areas and from all different practice settings to be on the same page in terms of what is OT, what isn't, and how do we conduct practice within OT. The cornerstones uh, are especially helpful, so be sure to reference that. And then this document articulates OT's contribution to health and wellness through occupation. So it's actually saying, how do we use occupation and how does occupation fit into occupational therapy and helping our clients either gain or regain a state of health and wellness? Within the OTPF, uh, they characterize occupational therapy as the therapeutic use of everyday life occupations with persons, groups, or populations. In other words, the client, for the purpose of enhancing or enabling participation. So let's unpack that just a little bit. Therapeutic use means that it requires someone that's trained, in other words, the occupational practitioner, to use everyday life occupations. Um, in this case, occupations can mean meaningful activities. And in the OTPF4, they've really expanded a lot in terms of considering the client both an individual, which we're used to, but also a group of people or potentially a population. So we're looking at a broader context. And then finally, uh, the reason we're doing this, the purpose is enhancing or enabling participation. So that's pretty cool, right? Um, and function and participation is what we're all about.